Hello, I'm JW. This time storage heaters and we've got an actual heater here which is going to take apart and see what's inside and also the most common faults that you can find with these things. Now this is just a demonstration, this is not connected to any supply but in the real world of course uh, before working on a storage heater a couple of things to be aware of. One is asbestos. A lot of old heaters, particularly those from the mid-70s and older, do contain asbestos so if you get one of those do not open it just has to be disconnected and then disposed of by an asbestos contractor. And then the other thing is to ensure the supply is disconnected. And this is not just a case of turn off the supply and check there's no voltage, because of course storage heaters are on timed circuits, which could switch on at any time. So as well as switching off, make sure that the switch is actually open and there is no continuity between both sides of the switch. In this case, presence or lack of voltage is not sufficient. Don't think also that storage heaters only turn on at night, whilst they usually do. Quite a lot can also turn on in the daytime for a boost period in the mid-morning or late afternoon. So just because it's off doesn't mean it's going to stay that way. Now the heater we have here is a fairly old one. It's uh, probably 20 years old or so. No asbestos in this one. And so this is not connected to any supply either. So obviously we're not going to be checking any of that. And uh, this is a Dimplex model, although it's actually branded some other label, but that's again pretty common. And again, this is a fairly typical example, but again, others will be slightly different. So let's have a quick look around the outside, see what the deal is there. Now, this is a fairly typical example, and this is a two element heater. There is a smaller model in this, which is basically half the width. And then, of course, there are larger ones as well. Now, these things are extremely heavy, and all the weight is actually taken by the two feet down here at the bottom. Those are normally resting on the floor. And then the other thing is, very importantly, on the side here, you'll see that there is a screw there, and there's one on the other side. That actually holds the heater into this bracket. Do not remove this, because if you do, the heater can then tip forwards and fall on the floor, causing serious injury. So this is only removed after the heater has been totally dismantled, and then you can take away just the basically an empty box, but uh, certainly not in its assembled state. And this one, like most, has uh, a couple of controls just on the top here. Now we see the two dials in there, which we'll have a look at a bit later. Grating on the front where basically the heat comes out. And the rest of it is just basically sheet steel. A bit scratched up in this case, but uh, that's because it's fairly old. And uh, to open these, generally there's a couple of screws underneath. And we can see here, in this case, it's this one here. And a corresponding one over that side. Some of these have the screws in that position, some are sort of vertically up into the bottom, but they're all pretty much the same. The idea is just you take these out and then the front cover just lifts away, revealing what's inside. So let's just get to that. So if the screw is just a uh, screwdriver is appropriate, and just go on and remove the two screws. These are quite bothersome to get at because normally this is on the floor. I've put it up on this table so we can get to it more easily. But essentially, the two screws come out, then the front cover just lifts forward and it just hooks over the top here. So, just a question of easing it over the top. And that lifts away just a metal cover. What we've now got inside is the inner cover. This is just steel, and there's screws around the edge here securing that in position. With this cover off, we can also get to the input wiring. So this is not actually connected. Flex goes in the bottom here. And we can also see there's a gap at the top here and access to the bit just under the controls. Now at the bottom, you can see the label, Heat Store. This is a, a Dimplex one that's been rebranded as that label. Also has the model number and the rating. In this particular case, uh, weighs 77 kilograms when assembled. So again, you don't want that falling down on top of you. And it's got the uh, input power here, 1.56 kilowatts. And if it's run over for the perfect time, it stores up to 12 kilowatt hours. Also at the bottom here, we can see the wiring block for the element. And that's just two screws on the top for the element on there. And then there's just two wires going at the bottom. Exactly the same with this one, two at the top there for the element pins. And then the two wires in at the bottom. This is the input terminal block here. So this is your incoming flex from the switch on the wall. Just line and neutral going into the terminals. Earth connection here on a stud directly onto the frame of the heater. And we can see that there is actually a label here just indicating how that connects. And it does need to be heat resisting cable as well. And as we said at the beginning, isolate circuits before doing anything. 
Now from the top here we can see the two knobs there which we saw previously. This one goes through to a thermostat behind this cover. And here is the thermostat. This is basically just a switch. It's got two wires here, input and output. All that happens is when it's turned up, it connects the two wires together. And then when it reaches whatever temperature you've set, it will then open the circuit, just breaking the connection between the two wires. These can fail, but they're fairly easy just to screw in a new one, of course, and connect up the two wires. This knob here, which is also marked, say 1 to 6 there, and you see that's actually marked on the control panel here as the output. This is not an electrical item, this is just purely mechanical. It's sort of a cam-shaped piece here, and you can see it attaches to this bar in the side, which is on the end of this piece over here. Now if I actually turn this, you'll see that it will revolve and it presses down onto that bar on the left there. And when it presses it enough, it actually opens this flap here. This is just a mechanical piece of stuff there, and it basically allows air to come out of the holes in the top of the cabinet there. So if you open this all the way out to full, basically as soon as it's on, heat is going to start pouring out from the holes here. And of course if you close it down, it just covers up that hole so less air comes out. It doesn't stop it completely, but just less comes out of it. The other feature of this is in here, this is a biometallic strip, so as the heat of temperature increases this will bend, so at some point it will actually open the flap anyway, the idea being that it only opens once the heater has got up to temperature. But it's basically just a mechanical opening there, and you can see in there there's holes go down inside the heater cabinet. So the deal with controls these, set the input as to how much heat it's going to store overnight on the charge, Suggested four initially, then adjust to whatever. So turning that further means it stores more heat. Turning it down, it will store less. And then this thing basically determines whether you get what they call a boost, which is basically when the flap opens and more hot air comes out. So if you set it to minimum, then it doesn't ever do it. And as you gradually increase it, it uh, either opens slightly earlier as the temperature increases, or if you crank it around to full, also you get uh, a lot more a lot earlier. Pretty crude and uh, basic, but nevertheless does work to a fashion. Now to get in further, you just take off these screws around the edge here. There are a couple of these missing, so I've uh, also had this open before. But just in case of uh, removing these fairly short little screws, these are not the same as the screws that hold the front on, so keep those separate. And the other point about storage heaters is you should only dismantle them when they're actually cold. This should be fairly obvious and common sense. But uh, when these things are hot, they do reach extremely high temperatures. Hot enough to burn paper. If you just place paper against one of the bricks, it would instantly set on fire. So we're not talking about hot boiling temperatures. We're talking about massively higher than that. So uh, unless it's completely cold, don't bother. And if you're going to take any old ones out, you want to make sure that they were switched off at least 24 hours before you come in to dismantle them, because they can retain heat inside for a surprisingly long time. Now this is just a steel panel. These dimples just to space it between this and the front cover to provide a sort of an air gap. And this just lifts away. This is just an insulation panel here. This, this is not asbestos, but on some of them obviously it could be. Just bond it to the back of that. Notice it's actually quite thin, so although these have insulation, it's certainly nothing uh, particularly substantial. And then inside we can see the bricks here, which are literally just bricks made of various materials. Some manufacturers call these fancy names like energy cells, but they're just bricks. And around the edge we've got some insulation, and also along the bottom as well. And again, this is just fiberglass in this case, but of course that could be asbestos if it was an older model. And if you've got to a special insulation like this at this point, then it's already too late. Now these are fairly heavy, but uh, they just lift out, so the question of just moving it forward. And uh, you can see the element inside. And we see the bricks have got a recess there, so that first the element can actually fit in. And then on this particular side here, where we saw that flap on the top before, it allows air to actually pass through here, so when this flap on the top is open, air is drawn up here, slots in the bottom, comes up the top and then comes out of there. So uh, fairly straightforward. So you can see this has two elements. Uh, these just sit here, they're not uh, attached at all, just freestanding, basically held in the two channels within the bricks there. And to remove them it's just the two screws at the bottom and then they will just lift out. 
Now in terms of what can go wrong here, of course the elements themselves can fail. We've seen that in previous videos, so uh, you can actually just remove the elements by loosening the two screws here and lifting the element out and then testing that as we've seen in a previous video. But in terms of how these things work, basically your power comes in here, line and neutral. The line conductor here in the brown just goes through the terminal block and uh, just behind this paper, which is the separator, you see the black wire goes into a tube there with another black wire. And what's actually happening is that just goes up behind, comes up to the top, and it's this one here. So one of these is your line input, goes to the thermostat. Assuming the thermostat's on, it just goes through there and comes out on the other wire. So I want to check for continuity across the thermostat. There should be continuity there when the thermostat is turned up or when it's cold. If there isn't, then new thermostat is required. So just question over between the terminal here and then the terminal on the back. That black wire then just comes back down to the bottom. And it's basically the other wire just coming out of here. Just goes straight into the first heating element. The neutral on the top just comes straight out of the neutral and goes to the other side of the heating element. And that's pretty much all of the electricals in this thing. It's just a heating element connected in series with the thermostat, which is your switch, and then the power just comes in. And the second element is just literally taken off the bottom. There's another wire here, another one there, and they just come across to the other element connection here. And if there was another one, it would just continue on with another loop from there to the next one, and so on. Now you can test the elements individually, as we've seen, but you can also test them in bulk, as it were, test all of them. Resistance between the line and neutral, you should get an appropriate resistance for the rating of the heater, say in this case uh, 1.56 uh, kilowatts there. And this is basically just Ohm's law again with the uh, voltage, current and the resistance, and I can obviously work out from the power as well. And the other thing of course is if you've got two elements in parallel then the resistance should be half of a single element, and again you've got four it's going to be a quarter and so on. So just test here, and you can also do the insulation resistance test between either one of these and of course the earth terminal over on the casement of the heater. So you can actually do most of the testing without actually taking the inner out, but we're taking the inners out in this case just because we can. Now to take out the element we'll take this one out here, so we'll just go in here, loosen the two top screws. And then the element just lifts away. This is similar to what we saw in that other video, just two pins there which go into the terminal block. Continuous length element and just rests up there. No actual other fixings, it's purely the two pins there and then it just holds in place via the bricks and the sort of recess in it. Some of them have a more decorative recess with sort of nobbles in the middle where it holds the middle in, but all basically the same inside. And in terms of what's behind these, if you want to actually take these out completely, you do need to remove at least one of the elements. And then these bricks here, again, just lift away. All they've got behind is just another piece of insulation. And uh, then it's just a steel casing behind that. And to get the other bricks out, you can either take the element out, but of course you can also just slide these over. And again, just leave the other elements in position. Now, what about uh, testing? Well, just a quick example. I'm going to use this multimeter in this case because you don't necessarily need to have uh, very expensive testing equipment. Pretty much any multimeter will do. So, we'll just turn this around to the ohms scale, in this case, with a uh, audible signal as well. And of course, it's common in uh, the ohms terminal. This amps hole really shouldn't exist. That's never used for any main electrical type work, so you might as well stick some chewing gum or something in there to make sure it's never used. So, so this will beep when there's continuity. So we can check the thermostat up here, again just between the two terminals. Now one of them is actually in the back there, so not very easy to reach, but between that one and then the front one, as we can see there, there is continuity, basically uh, zero ohms. If there wasn't, then the thermostat is broke, or it's very hot and it's turned up to uh, or turned to a fairly low setting there. Either way, if it doesn't show any continuity there, you're not going to get any power to the element, so the thermostat would need to be replaced. 
And then the other thing of course is down here, we can check both elements at the same time. Just go in to the two terminals here. So we have continuity, we can see here resistance of 32 ohms. Again that's about right for a heater with two elements. If there's only one element it should be in the sort of region of about double that, so roughly 64 or so. And if it was a four element model, basically twice the width, then you would expect to see about half the resistance or around 16 or so. And as I saw in that element testing video, the actual exact measurement doesn't particularly matter. What you're looking for is something in the right kind of area. Don't get too hung up on the fact that it might be a few ohms one way or the other. Really what you're looking for is are all the elements present or have they actually busted, in which case you're going to see significantly different readings. And in terms of installing these things, certainly the ones with the single supply, it's just a three core flex here, heat resistant, appropriate size, generally 1.5 millimeters squared will be sufficient for most of these. And importantly, you don't connect these through fused connection units, you just want to use a 20 amp isolator because these are generally connected to their own individual circuits, typically going to be around 16 amp circuits or possibly 20 in some cases. But you don't need any additional fuse here and in fact most storage heater manufacturers, which is basically only one of them now, recommend you do not use fuse switches because fuses heat up when they're in use and if you do put one there it's going to be on say seven hours at full load, that's going to get hot and of course they can fail. So just a 20 amp switch stuck next to the wall here. Some people like to put neon indicators in them but uh, really not necessary, just a question of turning on and off for maintenance or whatever. And say heat resistant PVC in this case, some older ones will have rubber but uh, either way all works the same. So that's storage heaters, pretty basic and uh, simple devices. Testing really just need a uh, device that shows continuity or resistance, so a multimeter or whatever. And of course you can use multifunction testers set to continuity as well, no problem with that. But you certainly don't need any uh, kind of advanced equipment. And in terms of uh, dismantling, again pretty straightforward. Just make sure you've uh, obviously made it cool down properly and you've confirmed that the power is not only off but the switch is also open because say, they can turn on at any time without warning. And uh, say most of these can be repaired fairly easily. The only things that break really are the elements, sometimes the thermostats, but uh, both of those still readily available. And of course much cheaper than buying new heaters. And if you're going to be getting rid of these, as a lot of people now are, leave it 24 hours at least before opening. Make sure there's no asbestos. And then just basically uh, open dismantle as we've seen here. Take all the bricks out and then you've got a fairly lightweight casing. You can then remove the screws located in the sides there just to lift it away from the bracket and dispose of it. And uh, the newer ones, which you can still buy, like the Dimplex Quantum or whatever, those work in a very similar way for the storage part. They also have an additional heating element, a fan and an electronic controller, and that's powered from normally a separate supply. So you'll have two supplies into that, the off-peak one and also the uh, permanent one for the electronics and whatever else. But uh, until next time, thanks for watching.